to talk about religion in this video, but before I can get there, I need to tell you about a little bit of American history. In 1841, William Henry Harrison became the first president of the United States to die in office. He died of pneumonia, having been president just over one month. Upon Harrison's death, his vice president, John Tyler, took the oath of office and became the new president. No big deal, right? Actually, at the time, it was a very big deal, and that's because the section of the Constitution describing what happens when a president dies, resigns, or is otherwise removed from office is very ambiguous. Article 2, Section 1, Clause 6 of the Constitution reads, quote, in case of the removal of the president from office or of his death, resignation, or inability to discharge the powers and duties of the said office, the same shall devolve on the vice president. When Harrison died, there was disagreement between the cabinet and John Tyler over whether the powers and duties of the president devolving to the vice president meant that the vice president actually became the president or merely acted as president until the next election. Harrison's cabinet and Tyler's political opponents wanted him to be treated as an acting president, but Tyler insisted that the death of Harrison had made him the full and rightful president of the United States. This became known as the Tyler precedent, and it was followed every time a president vacated the office before the end of a term from then on. Vice Presidents Millard Fillmore, Andrew Johnson, Chester Arthur, Theodore Roosevelt, Calvin Coolidge, Harry Truman, and Lyndon Johnson all became president following the deaths of their presidents, according to the Tyler precedent. Here's what I find fascinating about this. The Tyler precedent wasn't codified until the ratification of the 25th Amendment to the Constitution in 1967. That means that for over 120 years, the ascension of the vice president to the presidency following the removal of the president during a term was not so much a matter of law as written, but a matter of law as interpreted and practiced. The way Harrison's cabinet interpreted that clause of the Constitution in 1841 was just as valid as Tyler's. When the cabinet said Tyler shouldn't become the president, but merely the acting president, they weren't wrong. And Tyler wasn't right. It was a matter of interpretation, and it just so happens that Tyler's interpretation was the one that everyone wound up going along with in the long run. Though we try to avoid it as much as possible, this kind of ambiguity in the law is inevitable. That's because when we interpret laws, we aren't just trying to understand what the words on the page mean, we're trying to understand what those words are telling us to do, what restrictions or responsibilities the words are imposing upon us. So when we come to differing interpretations of the law in that way, those interpretations can be very difficult to reconcile. That's one of the main reasons why we have courts, institutions that our society has empowered to interpret the law and settle disputes. And notice that we don't just have one level of courts, we have many different levels of courts. So if we feel we have been unfairly treated by the ruling of one court, we can appeal to a higher court. This inevitable ambiguity in the law and the subjective nature of interpreting the law is something that the architects of our legal system recognized and accounted for. This same sort of ambiguity occurs when religious believers interpret their scriptures. See, I told you I was going to get around to religion eventually. When a Christian reads the Bible or a Muslim reads the Quran, they aren't just interpreting what the words on the page mean. They're interpreting what the text is saying to them. And if Christians interpret the Bible differently or Muslims interpret the Quran differently or the followers of any faith interpret their scriptures differently, there's really no way to objectively resolve their disagreement because there's no way to determine which interpretation is the correct one to the exclusion of all other interpretations. Unlike the laws of the U.S., which are ultimately subject to the Constitution as interpreted by the courts, religious texts and the doctrines based upon them aren't subject to any unanimously accepted authorities. If a Christian belonging to one church reads the Bible one way, and a Christian belonging to a separate church reads the Bible another way, neither one of them is right or wrong. They have differing interpretations, 
and the way they practice their faith will be affected by their respective interpretations. This unavoidable ambiguity when it comes to interpretation is why I dislike the concept of the true believer. To my way of thinking, every person who sincerely follows a religion ought to be considered a true believer, regardless of which interpretation they hold to. But the term true believer is almost always used to describe fanatics, snake handlers, those who reject modern medicine, members of separatist cults, terrorists. To be a true believer, to be an authentic Christian or Muslim or what have you, one must be an extremist. And by extension, liberals and moderates who identify as members of those faiths are less authentic than their fanatical counterparts. But who is to say the version of a religion practiced by a moderate is any less legitimate than that practiced by a fundamentalist? Who is to say the interpretation of the fundamentalist is correct and that of the moderate is not? As an atheist, I don't think religious texts are in any way divine or supernatural, so I don't interpret them as telling me to do anything. But even so, I see no reason to privilege the interpretations of the fanatics over those of the moderates. If a Christian believes their religion calls them to love and forgive and treat all people with dignity and respect, and they don't feel themselves bound by the passages of the Bible, which fundamentalists read as calling for the execution of gay people or the subjugation of women, who am I to tell that Christian that they're practicing their faith the wrong way? or that they aren't as Christian as the more conservative members of their faith. If a Muslim believes they're called by the Quran to be charitable and peaceful and never to be violent, what purpose am I serving by arguing that they are less observant of their faith than members of a radical terrorist cell? The only authority that could possibly weigh in to settle all disputes based on differing interpretations of religious texts is the authority supposedly responsible for those texts in the first place, God. Only God could say, this is my true intended message, and these are the rules by which I want you to live, and you are living in accordance with my will, and you are not. But to date, God hasn't said that. I think God hasn't said that because there is no God, but whether there is no God or there is a God but one who declines to intervene to settle religious disagreements, it seems we're stuck with the present situation. There is no ultimate earthly religious authority capable of codifying a particular interpretation as the official correct version as was done with the Tyler president with the ratification of the 25th Amendment. We must continue to live in a world where religious believers will read and interpret their scriptures and the responsibilities and restrictions imposed upon them by those scriptures in a wide variety of ways. As an atheist, and more importantly as a humanist, and as someone who wishes to see human society continue to evolve toward peace, equality, and justice, I would rather we didn't continue to treat the extremists, the fanatics, and the zealots as though they're the only ones who have got it right. Hey folks, hope you enjoyed this one. If you did, please like, share, and subscribe, and also please consider helping me to make more videos like this one by supporting this channel through Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash steveshives to become a patron. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.